Well, good evening, everybody. It's great to be here, great to see you, and uh, looking forward to being in the Word together with you this evening and learning more and more about Jesus Christ. So if you'll open your Bibles, please, to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And if you'll stand with me, please, um, let me read to you the portion of Scripture that we're going to try to get through this evening. And if you need a Bible and don't have one with you, please just let uh, one of the ushers know. Revelation chapter 1, beginning in verse 9. I, John, your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last. What you see, write in a book and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars. Out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And I have the keys of Hades and of death. Write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. The mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels or messengers of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. And then in chapter 2, to the angel or the messenger of the church of Ephesus write, these things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands, I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have pers 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 persevered, excuse me, you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. And then uh, just a few more verses. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, These things says the first and the last who was dead 
and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are a synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of those things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the church, excuse me, what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. Well, Father, thank you for your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, as he is revealed to us in this book. And we ask for the Holy Spirit's ministry in each of our lives this evening. We also ask, Lord, that you might cleanse us of any impure thoughts or deeds or actions that we've uh, had today that have not been pleasing to you. We pray for your forgiveness, and we ask for that same Holy Spirit to come and refill us tonight, Lord, with his power, that the love of God might be shed abroad in our hearts by that same Holy Spirit. We pray also, Lord, that he would give to us the spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of God, that our eyes would be enlightened that we might know the great power that you have toward us. And so, Father, we look forward to your ministry in each one of our hearts this evening, and we would like to thank you in advance for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, you may be seated. Uh, the word revelation, sometimes people call it the book of revelations with an S. It's actually uh, the revelation of Jesus Christ, and the word revelation means unveiling, kind of like a statue that has a, a beautiful cloth or a sheet over it. It's never been seen before, and you come and you remove the cloth, and you see the, the beautiful statue. And so uh, this book is a unveiling to us of the person of Jesus Christ. It is not only... Um, a book that deals with the events that are going to come to pass, but it is a book that shows us that Jesus Christ is truly the beginning and the end. He is the first and the last, and he's in charge of everything that's taking place in the world. And so it's that unveiling of Christ in that place of being not the suffering servant whom we saw riding in on a donkey as he came into Jerusalem, to be crucified, but now as the risen Savior, the coming King, uh, who's going to bring his wrath, by the way, against his enemies. You know, you sometimes wonder about why is it that this great tribulation is going to take place? Well, it's going to take place against those who outwardly reject the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's going to cleanse the world of sin, and he's going to punish sin, uh, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2 that the Lord knows how to reserve the ungodly for the day of judgment and to deliver the godly out of temptation. So Christ is going to bring his judgment against an ungodly world, and he is reserving the godly to deliver us out of temptation. Um, but here in verse 9, we stopped in verse 8 the last time, uh, he says, I, John, and of course, this is the same John who wrote the book of Revelation, uh, not, not Revelation, but the Gospel of John, 1 John, 2 John, and 3 John. He says, I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was on the island that is called Patmos, for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John identifies himself, first of all, as he says, both your brother and your companion. So uh, it's interesting that he, it's not interesting, it's, it's encouraging uh, 
uh, to note the humility that he had here because he's, he's had already written this book as he was instructed to do and uh, he could have said many things about himself. I mean, imagine the reality that no one else has had this revelation like John did. God selected him to do this. And um, rather than being puffed up, the Bible says that knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. And so John remained humble in the midst of uh, this tremendous unveiling of Jesus Christ. And, and of course, humility means to be low before God. It means to have an accurate understanding of who we are. And uh, the Bible says, what do we have that we haven't first received? And so we aren't the propagators, we aren't the originators of the blessings of God. We're the containers in to whom God pours out his goodness and his grace, and he blesses the humble in heart. He actually resists the proud, and of course, pride is the sin that caused Satan to be uh, in the condition that he's in today. He wanted to, he was unhappy with who he was. He had been created by God, and he wanted actually to be like God. He wanted to be God's equal, if you will. And uh, pride gets us into a lot of trouble. In fact, the Bible says pride goes before a fall. But, bless, but humility goes before a blessing. So John is a tremendous example for us of humility. And it's a good thing for us to ask the Lord to humble us. Help me, Lord, to walk in humility. Jesus Christ himself said, I'm lowly and meek. So he, of course, the, the Lord of lords, the King of kings, he humbled himself and he became obedient even unto death, the death of the cross. So here's John identifying himself simply by using his name. But then he, he says to us, I'm your brother. He had been born again. He was part of the body of Christ. He was writing to other Christians and so we are related. Uh, Kevin is a brother in Christ. Uh, Jiggs is a brother in Christ. Sam is a brother in Christ. Uh, Don is a brother in Christ. Mike, Janet is a sister in Christ. And we'll stop right there. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I never mind. I don't want to waste my time with silly stories. But we were all, we were all related just simply as human beings in the brotherhood of man, if you will. But then when we turned to Christ and we were born again, the Holy Spirit of God came and he baptized us into or immersed us into the body of Christ. So we're related. We are related. We have the same father. We are indeed brethren. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And uh, John is identifying himself, first of all, as your brother. And we'll meet him someday. He goes on to say, and companion, uh, or partner. He says, I'm not only your brother, but I'm your partner. And he says, in tribulation or in suffering. And the word that he uses here uh, for tribulation uh, is a word that speaks of bearing a great, great burden, an extreme burden of being burdened beyond measure, as it were, of really experiencing a lot of trouble, a lot of pressure. So uh, we often think when we go through a time of difficulty, uh, we think, my mother told me there would be times like this and didn't even pay attention to it, but when it happened, I, yep, she knew. But also we often think no one else is going through what I'm going through. But of course, the Bible tells us that um, these things that happen to us are, are common to all men. We all go through these periods of tribulation. And John, of course, had been banished to the island of Patmos, a small little island somewhere in the Aegean Sea between the uh, maybe a little bit west of the southern area of Greece. 
um, a rocky island. It was a, a colony that they used for prisoners. He was an aged man. Uh, history tells us that uh, he's the only apostle that was not martyred. They sought to martyr him by literally in the Colosseum there in Rome, putting his entire body in a boiling uh, pot of oil. And miraculously, he didn't die. And so to do something with him, they banished him to this island. Uh, you can imagine the, the, tr the trouble that he had been through leading up to that attempted assassination there in Rome. But now as an aged man, he probably, uh, and 90 years old back then was, a, was, I think, older than 90 years old is today, given the, the lack of medical technology. I mean, he could have been suffering with all kinds of arthritic pains and diseases. He didn't enjoy the comfort of clean sheets and a hot shower and an air-conditioned home or a heated home or refrigeration for his food and making coffee in two minutes and having, you know, those kinds of things. So uh, he was going through trouble. He says, I'm your partner. So I'm not only your brother, we're related, but I'm, I understand what it is to, to go through suffering. And, and uh, of course, one of the realities about suffering is that not only do we suffer for the name of Christ and because we're Christians, but we also experience the comfort of God. He comforts us in all of our tribulation that we may comfort others with the same comfort wherewith we have been comforted. Now, when we're going through trouble uh, and tribulation, it's hard for us to conceptualize that, you know, someday God is going to use what I am going through to actually comfort other people. However, if you stop and reflect uh, on the experiences you've had, if you've been through serious trouble, you know that now God has comforted you. You have more compassion for other people. You understand the language of the soul. It's deep calling unto deep, and you're able to comfort other people. And uh, Paul in 1 Thessalonians spoke of comfort one another. And in this world that lies in the grip and the hand of the wicked one, uh, my, how we need comfort. So John uh, was a partner. He was a brother in Christ. He was a partner in suffering and also and in God's kingdom. Not only is there suffering now, but he was looking forward to the reign and the rule of Jesus Christ, which, of course, God had already revealed to him. So he, could, he was shown the whole picture, including the 1,000-year reign of Christ. Uh, we pray, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So as brothers and sisters in Christ, not only do we share together in the sufferings of this present life, but there's coming an end to those. We've been made joint heirs with Christ and we'll share together in that period known as the millennial kingdom. What an amazing uh, time that's going to be. We'll have to get to the end of Revelation to see it a little bit, but if you were with us when we were in the prophets, uh, it speaks a lot about that. And then also he says, and patience, the patience of Jesus Christ or the endurance. Now, here's a wonderful truth that is also connected with suffering is that God produces through our sufferings, he produces endurance. He produces that ability within our own lives to persevere through difficulty, to be ready for whatever God has in store. And it's kind of like those trees that uh, are on the top of the mountain that are exposed to the elements, the, the rain, the snow, the sleet, the, the fierce winds. They, they have to endure all of that and they, they're bent over and consequently those trees are much, much stronger than the trees that are hidden down in the valley that never experience the difficulties of life. But as you and I go through uh, our trials, there's, God is seeking to produce 
within us that endurance. In James chapter 1, he says, but let patience or endurance or perseverance have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So uh, the idea there is to cooperate with God when we're going through a time of difficulty. And it's okay to ask him, why is this happening? He may not show you. He's not bound to show you. Uh, it's natural to ask, when is this going to be over? He probably won't tell you that either. But it's okay to pour out your heart to him. In fact, in the Psalms, it says, pour out your heart to God at all times. And we can just be very frank with him. But what he's seeking to do is to make you into a well-rounded Christian. You know, little puppies, when you see them, they got long ears, big heads, big feet, and they're misproportioned. So are ch infants, by the way. Their heads are bigger than the rest of their body. And if you imagine if you saw an adult with a head as proportionally big as, are you with me? You'd say, Where, what planet did you come from? But over time, they grow into themselves. And that's God's will for you and I as Christians, that we would become well-rounded believers. So John is not a young Christian. He's not even a, a young man in the faith. He's a father in the faith. And he's speaking as someone who's been through all of this. And he says, I'm your brother. I'm your partner in suffering. I'm your partner in the kingdom of God. He had that hope. He never lost track of that hope. And by the way, uh, we don't have to lose track of the hope. You know how we lose track of our hope? Is if we stop growing. You just, when you're not growing, you can't see what's coming. But if you're growing, you'll be rich in the knowledge of what God is going to do. And also the hope that uh, we have in Christ, it tends to act as a purifying, it brings a purifying effect into our life. In 1 John chapter 4, it says, or chapter 3, every man that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. The more we are in the word of God, learning about the plans of Jesus Christ and that he is going to come again, and in fact, he could come at any moment in the rapture of the church. Uh, Bible scholars believe there are no prophecies that need to be fulfilled for Jesus to come and remove his church. So if we just thought about that and say, well, am I ready for the Lord to come or would I be ashamed at his coming? And so the purification of our lives is directly related to our personal relationship with God and growing in the knowledge of Christ and knowing that Jesus is coming again. So I, John, both your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and the patience of Jesus Christ. Imagine how patient God has been. He says, I was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. John had refused to acknowledge that Caesar is Lord. And as a result of that, they tried to kill him, couldn't, and they banished him to this island. He suffered persecution for the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Paul tells us in one of the pastoral epistles that all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. It's an interesting um, relationship between what you desire to do and what will happen to you. Uh, when I was a younger Christian and more inclined to be works-oriented rather than grace-oriented, I always thought, well, if, if I'm obeying God... And if I'm doing everything that God wants me to do, and if I'm really seeking the Lord, then my life is going to be really good. Well, it is going to be really good. However, all who will live godly, and to live godly simply means to be in step with God's will for your life, will suffer persecution. And you might think, um, why is that, that the more godly a person is, that they will suffer persecution. You might wonder, what's the relationship between someone who's putting Christ first and really seeking to know him and obey him and follow him and this barrage of persecution? Well, what kind of a, of a tool or an, an, an instrument would be a better 
uh, because Paul even uses that word, an instrument in the hands of God. What kind of an instrument in the hands of God, what kind of a vessel is a godly person that God would use them? A tremendous instrument, a tremendous vessel filled with the light and the love of Jesus Christ in this dark world. We do have an adversary who walks about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may dis devour and destroy. So a lot of Christians are kind of uh, secret agent Christians and they, and they just kind of hang back and they don't want to really get too involved with the Lord because they know, you know, uh, it's going to mean persecution. It's going to mean trials and tribulations. But uh, what greater joy is there than knowing the Lord and being a part of his plan and watching God work through your life and the lives of other people. I can't think of any other life that a person could, that even comes close to that. So um, you're probably thinking, are we going to get through any verses tonight? We'll just let the Lord lead us, okay? And um, the answer is probably no. But he suffered because he stood up for Christ. You may be suffering right now. Maybe it's in your family. They don't like you because you don't want to watch pornography on television. You don't like it when they curse. You're not interested in whatever they're interested in. And they start putting you down. They start uh, accusing you, being condescending towards you because you're not uh, fellowshipping with the works of darkness. So... Um, he says in verse 10, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, the Lord's day is probably a reference to Sunday. Uh, and the early church worshiped on Sunday because that's the day that Christ rose from the dead. When he says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, it's hard to know exactly what that means. Um, some have said a state of spiritual ecstasy. One man, one Bible commentator described it as John was not only elevated up towards God, but he was catapulted towards the 21st or 22nd century and was allowed to see everything. And so here he was in this horrible situation. He was probably worshiping the Lord on Sunday, even if it was by himself or with a few other believers. And all of a sudden, he says, I heard behind me, a loud voice as of a trumpet. Now, we're going to see the words as of or like often because um, these were things that John had never seen before or heard, and so he's using his own vo mental vocabulary, his own cultural upbringing to describe for us what he heard. He said, I heard a voice as of a trumpet. I mean, imagine the last time you heard a trumpet blowing. It's hopefully on key. I mean, it's a loud noise. All of a sudden, he hears this voice, and he says it's as like it was as of a trumpet. So it was a blasting, not an unpleasant noise, but a very powerful noise. And he heard it, and... Uh, so he says, and I heard behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Those are the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. The first and the last. Here, this person whom we know is Christ is identifying himself as divinity, as God. I'm the beginning, I'm the end. And he says, and what you see right in a book. Now he's being given not only an identification as to who is speaking to him, but he's being given a uh, job to do, and it was simply to um, write what you see. Write it in a book, that's number one, what, what you're about to see, because he's, he's just hearing now this voice. He hasn't even turned around yet, and the voice is speaking to him, and the voice is telling him, who he is. It's Jesus identifying himself. And he said, I'm telling you to write in a book what you're going to see here in just a moment. And then I want you to send it to the, that book to the seven churches which are in Asia. And he identifies each one of these churches. This would have been 
uh, there in what would be western Turkey, uh, a, a part of Turkey, excuse me, kind of like in a maybe a, a crescent. Uh, it would have been a great postal route if you were in the post office because you could just go to each one of these real churches. So, John, I want you to write down what you're going to see. Right? I want you to write it in a book, and then I want you to send it, make sure that it gets to all of these churches. Now, what a wonderful thing that the Lord would unveil to these churches and to us today himself what he is doing, what he has planned, what he will do, etc. And he lists all of those seven churches, uh, Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. Then, he says in verse 12, then after hearing that, that mission, then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. So, what a, what a great picture of what we can do and what we ought to do when we hear God speaking to us. I turn. And when we hear God speaking to us, sometimes we don't like what he's saying because he could be pointing out some big, medium, or little sin in your life, if you want to call it in those terms. And we don't necessarily want to hear what God has to say because of the pride and the, uh, as we learned um, last Sunday morning about sin, the out-and-out -out rebellion against God. We can just rebel against him. But what John was doing is an example of what we should do when we hear the word of God. We should turn to him. And he, so he said, I turned to see the voice. I mean, can you imagine this trumpet-like voice telling him what you're going to see? I want you to write this in a book and I mean, all of this was new to him. He, he had no idea. This just happened. So I turned to see the voice. I wanted to see, not the voice that's on TV, you know, that musical one, but I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. God was speaking to John, and he wanted to see, who is this? God speaks to us. We hear his voice in the Bible. And the more that we turn to him to hear what he has to say, and the more that we respond to him in obedience, the more he will speak to us. The, the less we respond in obedience to him, the less he will speak to us. This is why Jesus often said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying. So then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, now we see what he saw. I saw seven golden lampstands. That's the first thing that he saw were these seven golden lampstands. And we have no idea of how big they were, how small they were, or anything like that. But then in verse 13, he tells us what else he saw. And in the midst of the seven uh, lampstands, so apparently... The lampstands were like in a circle. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man. This is a phrase that was used repeatedly in the Old Testament. And um, here it's being used, it was used of Daniel. It's been used of many other uh, people. But here it's being used of Jesus Christ many, many times in the New Testament. So in the midst of the, the, the seven lampstands, which we're going to see is, are the churches, was one like the Son of Man. And he uses again, it was one like. It's the best he could say. It was like, yes, it's like the Son of Man. And we have here the most vivid, detailed description of Jesus Christ given to us in the entire Bible. It's right here. There's no other place in the Bible that describes with the detail that we have of who Christ is. He was like the Son of Man. He was clothed with a garment 
down to the feet. So his outer garment went all the way down to his feet and he was girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and his hair were white like wool, not indicating that he was old, but indicating rather that he was pure, the purity of Christ. And again, he's using the word like, uh, like wool, as white as snow. So try to imagine for a moment uh, this picture that he's seeing, his head and his hair were like wool, as white as snow. And again, he's as. We've all seen beautiful grounds covered with snow, perfectly white. And so he's looking and he sees his clothing and he sees his head and his hair and his eyes like a flame of fire. Again, like a flame of fire. This is a pretty scary, terrifying picture. And he fell down later. You know, people who say, you know, when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a talk with Jesus. There's a number of things I want to speak with him about. Listen, I'll tell you, when we get to heaven, First of all, we'll know even as we're known. We'll have instant knowledge of all things just as he knows all things except whatever mysteries he wants to keep to himself and unveil to us for the rest of eternity. But uh, we're going to be more like Isaiah who saw the Lord high and lifted up and he just said, oh, I'm undone. I mean, we're going to be worshiping the Lord and we're not going to say, you know, uh, I'd like to talk to you about what happened there in, uh, you know, September 14th back in 2016. What happened? How did that That's not going to be going on. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like fine brass. The, The eyes like fire would indicate his thorough knowledge of all things. And as we're going to see, he knew these churches perfectly, just as he knows each one of us. His feet were like fine brass, and in the Bible, brass is used of judgment. So here we see the risen Lord, pure, in him is light and no darkness at all. He is not only the Lord of lords, but he is the judge who's going to judge the whole world. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, absolutely righteous in his judgment and making no mistakes and his voice as a as the sound of many waters and when you hear the last time you were at the ocean and you heard the waves just coming in and breaking it up upon the rocks and the uh, boom boom and the power of it or the last time maybe if you were on a cruise and you heard the waves lapping up against the boat Uh, His voice was like the sound of many waters, a, a powerful voice. He had in his right hand seven stars. So he's holding these seven stars in his right hand, and he's in the middle of these seven lampstands. And out of his mouth went a sharp, two edged sword. Now, this is rather ugly looking. Uh, at this point, it would seem a, a sharp sword going out of your mouth. But really, the Word of God is described for us in the book of Hebrews as a sharp, double-edged sword that pierces to the dividing of the soul and spirit. And he is the Word of God. And so John is doing the best he can to tell us what he saw and he doesn't use the word as or like, but he said it was, it was a sharp two-edged sword. It was, he heard his voice. It was the voice of many waters and, and how cutting uh, and precise. And uh, there's, you know, uh, scalpels are, uh, depending on where they're made. I was just at the dentist the other day. And, can I tell you about it? No. I was just at the dentist the other day, and we were discussing uh, modern technology, dental technology, and the precision of instruments and, and uh, the quality of those things that they stick down in your gums. And, uh, you know, you want something that's probably made in Germany. 
something really, really sharp and really good. The Word of God is, is so powerful, so clean. And his countenance, his, his overall look, was like the sun shining in its strength. I mean, imagine, we can't even look directly at the sun. Do you remember when you were a child and you were curious to look at the sun, but your parents said, don't look at the sun, it'll hurt you. And you'd say, oh, okay, okay, but you'd try to sneak a look. And um, imagine his countenance being like the sun shining in its strength, not the sun that's rising or the sun that's descending as the earth turns, but the midday sun. So that's the description. And, and Jesus said, I want you to write down what you see, which he is doing in this part of chapter 1. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. So, uh, he just crumpled before him. I was, he said, I, I just fell at his feet as dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying to me, do not be afraid. So now we know why he fell at his feet as dead, because he was afraid. Wouldn't you be afraid if all of a sudden you heard this voice and you turned to see it and you saw what he just described? I'm certain you would be. Do not be afraid. And how wonderful of the Lord to say to his servant here who was afraid, do not be afraid. And I'm told that this phrase, do not be afraid, do not fear, fear not, etc., is the most repeated statement by God in the Bible, bar none. He says this more times than he says anything else. Do not be afraid. You may be afraid of something tonight. And we all know how unsettling fear is. You're, you become afraid of what's going to happen. And it's a very terrible feeling. And God tells us not to be afraid. I was recently, uh, even just this week, in fact, I think it was Monday night, I, I read something that brought fear to my, uh, my heart. And I, I was so upset. I mean, that isn't even the best word. I just, I thought, well, this is terrible. And I, and I realized I was afraid. And so I sat down to pray and as I was praying and telling the Lord, you know, I'm fearful right now, he brought the scripture to my mind, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. And I hadn't been able to read through my one-year Bible on Monday till Monday evening. For I can't recall, but some things happened Monday morning that threw me way off. And so I... I started reading through the one-year Bible, and when I finally got to the psalm of that day, there was that verse, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. And I thought, well, Lord, you just told me that, and now I'm reading it. So clearly, when I became afraid and I turned to you, you spoke to me, and here you're affirming it to me, and um, what time I am afraid, I will trust in you. And then the next verse says something like, in God, I will, in, in his word, I will praise God, or in God, I will praise his word. I can't recall, but it had the idea of not just simply trusting him, but of praising him. So I took my dog out for a walk, and I was saying to the Lord in my heart, because I'm still dealing with this fear, I was saying, well, Lord, I'm trusting you. You said to trust in you, and I'm here I am, I'm trusting in you, but I mean, is there like something else I can do because I'm trusting in you, but I'm still shaken up here? And then the Lord brought to my mind, well, that next verse, what did it say? It said, to praise God. So when David was afraid, 
he not only trusted in God, but then he began to praise the Lord in his fear. And I thought, well, that's something I can do. And so as I'm walking my dog, just within my heart, communing with God, I began to praise him. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm not somebody who really spends much time praising God in my own devotions. I thank him quite a bit. I'm very thankful. I'm very grateful to him. And I always like to begin a time of prayer by expressing my gratitude for whatever's on my mind. But I don't really spend a lot of time praising him. And I've realized that just really recently. And so I began to praise the Lord as I was walking. And and God, of course, inhabits the praises of his people. There's a verse in the Old Testament. And so as I began to praise the Lord, he was inhabiting my praises. And guess what happened to my fear? It just went away. And it hasn't come back. It may come another day, but it hasn't come back since that evening. And so... John was afraid, and the Lord said to him very kindly, put his hand on him, said, Don't, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I'm the beginning and the end. He was defining his superiority over all things. Someone has mentioned from this verse that God finishes what he starts. And we're told in the book of Colossians that he who has begun a good work in you, the work of salvation, will complete it and finish it until the day of Jesus Christ. So part of not being afraid was to realize, you know, God is in control. In fact, he goes on to say in verse 18, I am he who lives and was dead. That's pretty phenomenal, isn't it? I am he who lives. I was dead, but I rose from the dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. He's trying to encourage John. And he was being encouraged with the truth of who Jesus Christ is. And then he says, and I have the keys of Hades and of death. Now, the keys of Hades and death, they denote the authority of Christ over physical death and over Hades. It is appointed unto men once to die, and then comes the judgment. Do you know that nobody dies without the permission of Jesus Christ? He's in charge of life. I have the keys of life. I'm not going to die until God is ready for me to die. You won't die until God is ready for you to die. He also has authority over Hades. What is Hades? Well, it's that place where ungodly people, the unsaved, go when they die. Now, saved people, when they die, go immediately into the presence of God. Unsaved people, when they die, they go to a place called Hades. It is a place of punishment. It is a place of being in chained, if you will, reserved. It's a, it's a hellish-like place. I always think of Saddam Hussein. When they put that black bag over, he was so um, brazen. He didn't look very brazen when they pulled him out of that hole, did he? Did he? His eyes were like a deer. Big old rough beard. And he didn't look for days and weeks. He didn't know, look like he didn't know what was going on. But then as time went on, he regained his composure and his true self came out and they finally put that bag over his head and boom. And he immediately went to Hades. And there are people there right now. People we probably have known. Uh, if you're not a Christian and you die tonight, that's where you'll go. You'll go to Hades. And when the great white throne judgment takes place, God is going to call out of Hades everybody who's there. And he's going to open the books, which are a record of everything that those people have done, every thought that they've had, 
and he will judge them based on the way that they have lived outside of Christ. And he will then cast them into a lake called the lake of fire, which is, when we say hell, technically it's referring, that word refers to Hades, but the lake of fire is where people will wind up in what we think is hell. So right now there are people suffering in Hades, and one day they'll be standing before the throne of God, and we who are saved will be there also. We will see them. We will see all humanity that was in Hades being called before God Almighty. And he's a perfect record keeper. By the way, on the other side of this record keeping is he's keeping a record of your life as a Christian with the desire to reward you at the, at the reward seat, the Bema seat of Christ. He's an expert record keeper. He doesn't miss anything. You may, a lot of times people think they feel inconsequential and, you know, who am I, what am I, what difference am I making in the kingdom of God? Nobody even ever affirms or says thank you and I just go about my business and I'm a, I'm a nobody. You might feel that way. That's not unusual. And Satan would love for you to just keep thinking that. But that's not the truth. God knows exactly who you are. And he's going to reward you one day. So God was trying to encourage. Jesus was not trying to. He was encouraging John by letting him know how superior he, Jesus, is. And in verse 19, and of course we're going to end here in just a bit because I don't even want to begin to get into chapter 2. Um, in verse 19, you have an outline of the entire book of Revelation. Three things. The book breaks up into three distinct uh, areas. Number one, write the things which you have seen, which he's talking about what we've just read John hearing and turning and seeing. He said, I want you to write what you've just seen. And then I want you to write the things which are the circumstances which existed at that time. In context, it has to do with these churches. I want you to write down the things that are as Jesus writes the, the deals with these seven churches. And then... I want you to write about the things which will take place after this. After what? After the things which are. The church age will have an end to it. The word church is actually never used for the rest of the book of Revelation. Uh, many people, myself being one of them, believe that we are not appointed to wrath. The tribulation is the wrath of the Lamb of God against wickedness and sin. We are not appointed to wrath. God didn't save you to judge you in the tribulation period. But we are, we are not appointed to wrath, but we are appointed to salvation, which means to be rescued. We are not in the darkness that this day would overtake us as a thief. We're in the light. You think of what God did with Noah, who found grace in the eyes of the Lord. God saved him, he and seven other members of his family. The Bible teaches the coming of Christ and the removal of his church. And after the church age comes to an end, uh, we, we saw in the book of Second Peter, you know, I'm so used to having a mustache. I had one for, this part of my face hasn't seen daylight for about 48 years. And all through the day, I keep going like this. And what is this? Where did my mustache go? So please, I know you're deeply, you know, blessed by my telling you that. But I'm just self-conscious. In 2 Peter chapter 3, 
it says, God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to salvation. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So there is an end to this patience of God as he's reaching out to people, calling them to himself, making them part of the church. And so when, as we get into chapters 5 and 6, the beginning of the tribulation period, 6 and 7 on, all the way up to 19, the, the church is not mentioned. Are people going to be saved during that period of time? Yes, they will be. But it's not, the church is not mentioned, and it'll be a, a different atmosphere on this earth than we know it today. So the whole book of Revelation, right there in verse 19, write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. And then in verse 20, the Lord himself begins to give us some understanding to the symbols or the things that John saw. He says, the mystery of the seven stars, he calls it a mystery. The mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. He said, let me tell you what those are. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. Now, the right hand, of course, is the place of honor. We know that. The stars are the angels of the seven churches. The word angel may mean a supernatural being, implying that each church has a special guardian angel. It could mean that. Or more likely here, it refers to the human leader of each local church. So Christ is saying, I'm holding the leader of the church in my hand, the human leader, the leaders, the pastors, the elders. What a, what a wonderful place to know we're not only in his hand for salvation, but he's holding us in his hand. It's his church. Pastor Mike and I were just talking earlier, late this afternoon, earlier before the service, about the importance of not only teaching the Bible, that's never changing, but as leaders, we're not only responsible and how grateful we are to see the men and the women that God has raised up to teach. The women teach the, the women, and the men teach both men and women how grateful we are to see the Lord raising up leaders who can teach the Bible, but also there's more to leadership than just teaching the Bible. There is tending the flock of God. We're to shepherd the flock of God. And when you think about all that's involved in shepherding sheep, as leaders, we're to tend and care for the flock of God, and we'll be discussing that more. So the seven stars are the angels, the pastors of the, or the pastor of the seven churches. And God seems to identify here that there always is someone who is a leader and a leader among leaders. And a good leader among leaders recognizes the value of the multitude of counsel. One man's countenance sharpens another. If I could have a redo, there's many things I would redo in my life uh, one of them in general would be to practice what I preach, particularly in this area of taking the, the wisdom of taking the multitude of counsel. I think because of the insecurities that a young pastor has, I can remember when we were first starting out, I used to be the guy that would go down and set everything up at night down at the stinky old place at Gottschalk's where they'd have drinking bouts on Saturday night and cigars would... I used to go down there with my suit on, take my jacket off and sweat like a pig, clean everything up. It's more personal stuff. And then we moved to the YMCA and I kind of did the same thing there. They didn't have any booze on Saturday nights. And I remember when two of the guys came over to my little apartment one day and they said, Pastor Bob, we'd, we'd like to take, we'd like to start doing what you do down there. And I thought, 
You're trying to take over the church, aren't you? Dumb me. They were simply, they were so happy to be Christians. They were simply wanting to help. And I, I was too insecure to, and I said, well, what exactly do you mean you want to start doing this or that? Now, I know none of you have had any of what we call insecurities. I'm the only one, so I can speak to very freely about it. But there is a leader among leaders. You see that all through the Bible. And a good leader respects and appreciates others who are important in the body of Christ. And he, he has that view. That's a good leader. So that is one of the things I would redo. And so if there's anything you want to take off my plate, come see me, okay? I'm, I'm past my insecurities. In fact, you may never want to come see me again after you sit down and talk with me. And the lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. What a picture. You know that, that menorah, the uh, candelabra? Jesus is the light of the world. Now, Jesus said, but you're the light of the world too. Jesus is in us and the church is to be the light of Christ, to, to give light in the darkness. So he's just beginning to explain what he's going to do in the next two chapters, which are seven letters that Jesus wrote. Let me ask you this. What would it be like if Jesus came to your home tonight and he sat down and he just started examining everything about your life? everything went through your whole house could read your mind knew every little detail about you what would that be like <laughs> you probably would say uh, could you leave for a while and then come back later I wasn't really expecting you there are many practical lessons we're going to learn from these seven churches. It's Jesus examining these churches, commending them for where they can be commended, rebuking them for where they need to be rebuked, and encouraging them. And there's only two of the seven churches that didn't get a rebuke or a warning. The other five did. And those two churches apparently had it so together that there was just nothing wrong with them. Great thing to aspire to as believers. Well, let's have the uh, ushers come on up, please, and uh, we'll receive the tithes and the offerings here this evening. Let me just pray. Father, thank you so much for the time we've had together. And uh, as we go into this wonderful book, of Revelation, may we keep our eyes on you, Lord Jesus, because this is the unveiling of Christ and how you're working and how you're going to work. And we do ask, Lord, that you might, as David said in Psalm 139, try me or examine me and see if there be any wicked way in me. And so we invite, Lord, that searching of our hearts Search our hearts, God, and give us the grace of humility to be humble and to be obedient to you. Strengthen us in our inner man, and may we shine brightly for you in this needy, needy world. And we ask now, Lord, that you would be blessed as you receive from us uh, what we're giving to you this evening. It has come from you but we're giving it to you. In Jesus' name, amen.